uh, saying that we need to get started. So let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house of worship here today. We thank you for the life that you have given us, the pleasure and time we've probably spent with friends and family here in the last few days, and we ask for your guidance in today's lesson, and as we discuss it, let us have a great understanding of how uh, majestic and powerful you are in our world and in our lives. We thank you in your name. Amen. So, lesson number nine, contrary passages. So, I'll let you know that uh, when I when I do the lesson study, when I'm teaching it, I've for years and years, I've always just get up early Sabbath morning around four o'clock and I study my lesson. And that is sufficient, but I'll let you know. It was not sufficient on this one. This one, this lesson. Now, granted, this, this lesson study is, is in simple terms, just keeping it very biblical on uh, contrary to what these, uh, what some people might think these Bible verses are saying. We look at what other Bible verses say uh, in factual evidence and biblical terms, and we see how the, it's, it's based biblically. Okay, so that's, that's pretty, pretty simple and easy, understanding the Bible and the other Bible verses. But it, to research it and to really look in depth on the whole outlook on some of these verses and the theology in them and, and how, how different or how some people can take it in different ways, it's, there's a lot there. So anyway, but to get going, contrary passages. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. Peter warns us, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3, 15. But Paul adds, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay, so. Two very important Bible verses there. And I like to dwell on what Paul says there very simply. Preach the word, but in doing it, convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Okay, so whatever we do, however we want to try and persuade someone that they're wrong, and they might have a different theology than us. We don't t use the Bible and slap them in the face. And sometimes we probably lose our patience for the lack of earnest desire to truly understand the Bible verse. And we become impatient with individuals. And finally, we just write them off and say, you're not worth my time because you don't understand. But. The idea is that we need to convince, rebuke, rebuke, exhort with what? All long suffering and teaching. Okay. So, probably going to be a lot of discussion in this. And we're going to get started on Sunday's lesson. The rich man and Lazarus. This is quite a parable. Now. This is one of a very few times that Jesus does not say, matter of fact, a parable. In, in, in describing, he says, in a parable. And a lot of times he says that. He says, a parable. This he does not. He just goes into the story in a very, in a, in a, in a, in a setting as if the story is factual is literal, and sometimes people don't understand that, the situation behind it. So we'll read it. Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a, rich, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen 
and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good tidings and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great goal fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rise from the dead. Though one rise from the dead. Okay. Quite an interesting story. Now, why? Give me some reasons why some people will take this factual. Okay, spirit, just de de define that spiritualism. Meaning the belief in spirits, belief in afterlife, belief in the life after death, belief in the souls, uh, okay, either go to heaven or heaven or hell. Okay, spiritualism. Any other reasons? Because Jesus said it, said it matter-of-factly. Who was Jesus talking to at this time? Verse 14. Okay, okay. Describing the Pharisees, they were covetous because Jesus was implying that these Pharisees love money more than anything else. And they felt like wealth was a attribution to salvation. They believed that wealth was a gift from God for doing it. So, so their belief in wealth, so this plays into it that uh, Jesus talked in the Pharisees. And is talking in regards to a wealthy man and then a beggar named Lazarus. Okay. And they're talking about Abraham as well. So we have a good, a few reasons why. For the most part, spiritualism, the belief in life after death. The spirit is there that you receive your reward at your death and either you go to heaven or hell. Okay. So what are the reasons why we don't believe this is truly the, the actual story that Jesus is implying. What reasons? Okay. We have those Bible, that Bible verse, the dead know not anything. Once the dead die, the, uh, they go to the earth and, the, and like ashes to ashes and dust to dust. There is no more. There is no breath. There is nothing. The dead know not, not know nothing. Okay. Um, Anything in this story to pick apart in regards to uh, this can't be factual because there's so many complexities here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the expanse between heaven and hell is not literal here. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's closeness. Okay, okay, the complexity of this bosom. Why does Abraham, so why did, why does Jesus even throw Abraham in this story? Okay, because the Pharisees, Sadducees, they all believe that Father Abraham was important and that 
in the in that that they believe that Father Abraham would be at the heaven's gates welcoming people in. That was their their tradition of belief and believing that when that should people you know when the time comes Abraham will be there at the heaven's gates welcoming people in. So the idea is that Abraham symbolizes heaven. Okay, same as today, a lot of people believe that Peter will be at the gates, the pearly white gates, welcoming people. Okay, so it's a, theology, it's a traditional idea. So Abraham's there and in the bosom. Uh, there's multiple things in here that people want to pick apart, but what is a parable truly for? There, what is a parable all about? Are we to look at the each little identity of things and then say, well, this must mean this. What are the parables for? It all points to one point. It all has one projected idea. Joanne? Pardon? Okay, so in this parable, okay, in this parable, not to be covetous, Okay. Okay. So there's multiple things in here that is of interest that correlates to the life of the Pharisees. Okay. They're covetous. Okay. And Jesus is talking about a rich man who has done everything for his gain, his personal gain on earth, and now finds out it is of no worth. There is no reward for the rewards you have received here in, on earth. There, there is no reward. So he finds himself in Hades. Okay. 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 There is no eternal life in he in Hades and hell, but only eternal life from God, from Christ. Okay. 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 Okay, so Lazarus was not raised from the dead until a few weeks later. Lazarus raising from the dead is only a few weeks later from this. So, but there is recognition most likely that Jesus is closely, uh, close friend to Lazarus. So, but the, 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 what is interesting is it does point to that in some regards. Because it says here in this last bit, now, we don't want to dive too much into parables and look behind the scenes and, and, and to say, well, there's a lot in here. No, it, it points like you're saying. There is one thing here. Covetousness here on earth is, it has no reward. Because your reward, because, it sim because the beggar who sat at the gate and received no reward has found his reward in heaven. And what is interesting here, so the reason why the rich man is asking Lazarus to come and touch his, uh, to dip his finger in water and to touch the tongue. Now, spiritualism, there are no tongues and fingers. We realize that. That's one obvious thing. We cannot to take this literal of his being their spiritualism because there is no fingers and tongues and such as that. So why is it that Jesus is, puts this into the story about how the rich man asked Lazarus to come and touch his finger in water, dip it into, set it on. What is the correlation there? What is the correlation there? Okay, we go back in the story there, and why was the beggar, Lazarus, taken and set at the gates? And what does it say that the beggar was hoping from the rich man? Crumbs. Something so small. And do you see the correlation here that the rich man would not give even crumbs to the beggar, but now he's asking for something so simple and so small to dip his finger, dip Lazarus' finger in water and to touch his tongue. So asking for something. This shouldn't be a problem. This should be of nothing. See the correlation there? Before, the rich man would not give crumbs from his table, but now he's asking for Lazarus to come and do something so simple. But Abraham, Father Abraham, says, no, no. Time has gone by. Time, the, your reward is no longer. No. 
So we see the correlation here that, that there is, first of all, after death, there is, no, there is no trading of rewards or anything like that. Death is death. Okay? But we see the correlation here that Jesus is still implying. He's, he's talking to the Sadducees. Listen, you people. You wouldn't even give something so simple to the beggars. But yet in this story, as I'm implying that in, the, in, in some regards, you would turn around and ask for something if it, realizing that, that your life is in danger and that you wanted some, something so simple. See the correlation. It's, it's, it's very interesting the way Jesus put this. Yes, he didn't ask Father Abraham to come and dip his finger. No, send the beggar. Okay, send the beggar. Still a slap, yes. It's still, this, this, this the rich man still it doesn't understand. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the Pharisees. You don't even understand in real life, and you won't understand in, in afterlife, you still. Okay. Let's go there. In Luke... Other chapters, Luke. Jesus finally, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they came to Jesus and they asked him, give us a sign so that we may believe. When did, were they doing that? Jesus was doing what already? He was doing miracles. And they asked him, give us a sign so we may believe. This is in reference to that, like you're saying. Jesus is saying that that telling, telling them that in this story, Father Abraham is saying, no, you have, this, you have what is written in Moses' books and all the prophets, and even if we were to raise someone from the dead, it's still not believed. Jesus, Jesus was at that point trying to imply the same thing. When the Pharisees and, Pharisees and Sadducees were asking him to, in, on a couple of different times, give us a sign so we may believe. Jesus, Jesus is saying this right here. The sign, even if someone was raised from the dead, of which someone did, and of which three, probably approximately three or four weeks later, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and they sought to kill Jesus even more. See all the correlation in here is Jesus talking to this group of people and saying, do not be covetous, do not have covetousness in this life because there's no reward. And Jesus is slapping them in the face sort of by saying, in this story, there are multiple things here that you are doing in life. You are not reading the books of Moses and the prophets. You are not looking at the gospel that is being presented to you today. Because even if a man, if someone was raised from the dead, you would still not believe. Because if the of what mo, of the books of Moses and the prophets are telling you right now, then the raising someone from the dead is not going to help. There's a lot in here that we leave out that some people leave out and just want to say this is talking about spiritualism. No, it's talking about life in general for all of us, the present. Life in general. That's what it's talking about. So, that, you know, for a lot of times we skip over that and we say, well, we don't like to touch these verses. It talks about Father Abraham's bosom. Whoa, too much in there. Let's skip. No, let's, let's leave out all that. And let's look at the facts that Jesus was talking about. So many other Bible verses are in here that correlates to what Jesus is talking about here. There's so much. So, so understanding the Bible and understanding what Jesus is talking about and all the other Bible verses through the Gospels, or even in the Old Testament, really, really paints this picture very nice that Jesus is pointing out here. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so how do we, as, as, very first part of uh, of the of the of the very first Sabbath afternoon. Peter warns, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be ready to give a defense when someone is willing to say, "Why do you believe this way?" Because I believe this way. So always be ready to give a defense. So how do we 
how do we now there's there's so many different we're going to go through there's four days of different passages that we're going to talk about that people other religions possibly uh, take out of context from what we believe so how do we create a defense for that well if we want to go biblically there are many different bible verses that we use to to uh, to say that truly these this parable here is in regards to what we believe and here are the Bible verses. The dead know not know anything. Okay, there is one thing. There are several Bible verses that talk about the state of the dead. So therefore, it should it should eliminate any any possible uh, discussion on there is life after death because Jesus in the in the Old Testament specifically says there is no life. So it's simple. Well, but simplicity. Sometimes people don't even take that. So then we start taking taking this Bible verse. Well, heaven and hell, are they that close together? Well, what great object is there to want to go to heaven after death if you have to look down and see? I think the, the author here probably talked about it, I think. You know, just say, I think that the idea is, let's say you have a cherished family member, and if we believe that there's spiritualism, then you are in heaven, and let's say you have a son or daughter that is in hell sitting there screaming, with agony and in torment. What good is heaven then? If the idea that this gulf is this close together, that life after death, some people go to heaven, some people go to hell, and we use these Bible verses by saying, well, people in heaven, they have the opportunity to look at people in hell and torment. Well, I don't think that anybody in a sound mind would say, I like that idea because I want to be in heaven watching my son or daughter living in torment, screaming in pain, asking for me to come help. To me, that doesn't sound like a very rational theology in believing there's life after death. So, I mean, there's different ways we look at it, and we try to say this doesn't make sense in regards to the way some people want to believe because, okay, so let's say someone wants to refute that. Well, if you refute that and believing, well, if you're in heaven, you really can't see people in hell, then you ref didn't you have to refute this whole story? So you take a little bit of it, and if they don't agree, well, if you, if you pick it apart and say, well, do you agree with this, that people in heaven are watching people in torment? Well, if someone says no, well, then you say, well, then you can't take this story and use it literally. And that's, that's sound advice. We, we don't take up the battle. Uh, God doesn't need us to battle for him. Uh, the Holy Spirit is raging wars beyond what we can even understand. And if we think we need to step in, into that battle and say, this is, I'm going to fight here now. No, God will give time and will give the time for uh, knowledge and wisdom to you when necessary. And so as you were asking, as far as the flames and all this, now we can go through uh, the Thessalonians and, and, and that and talk about the time of, of the uh, second coming and, and, and that. We can, we can go through all that with individuals uh, as far as uh, the uh, time of the end and uh, the, the, I mean, the uh, judgment time and and the thousand years and all that, and we can discuss that, and we can and, and discuss it in biblical terms. This is what we believe. Uh, but, uh, and, and again, we can just take the parable itself by saying, okay, this is how it begins. And here are some things in here that don't make sense according to what you believe. Just minor little things, but if it, if it doesn't, if, if you have to, if, if you're, whoever you're talking to has to say, well, yeah, that's probably wrong there but the rest is right well you say no wait a minute it all has to be right or if you can knock one little thing wrong with it then uh, you, you're 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 trying to build something on the wrong on the wrong uh idea so so moving on we got i, kn I knew this is going to be a lot of discussion it's it's there's I wish we would have only taken, I think, four of these, these four days should have been four different lessons. So, Mondays. Uh, today with me in paradise. Okay. So, that's a lot of times we uh, read that Bible verse, Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43. Jesus on the cross. 
And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, John 20, 17. Read John, John 20, 17. No, it says, uh, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Okay, in John 14, 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, in reading this, so... We understand the situation here, the, the uh, thief, two thieves on the cross, and one thief was reprimanding the other thief by saying, well, you know, this man is not worthy of this uh, type of, of uh, punishment, yet we are. Uh, let's, uh, not, uh, uh, let's not criticize this man between us. Uh, so, Jesus turns to him in John chapter 23, 43, Assuredly, I say to you, so... What is, so how should the promise to the repentant thief on the cross be understood in light of Jesus' words to Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene and his promise to his disciples? How should the promise to the repentant thief on the cross be understood? So, how do we refute that? Now, obviously, a lot of times we uh, just want to say, well, the comma is in the wrong place. Okay, th there's an argument. I mean, there's, there's an argument that you could say, you could sit there with an individual that doesn't believe in the same way, and we could just sit there and argue all day long. The comma's not in the right place. Okay, but let's get beyond that. Let's use other Bible verses to try and justify what we're, what we're implying here. So, how do those other Bible verses help in understanding what Jesus is saying here? Okay, well, Jesus did not go to paradise that day uh, when, on the crucifixion. Crucifixion uh, it was in that afternoon. Uh, so Jesus, as, as on Sunday morning, when he spoke to Mary, he says, Do not touch me. I have not yet ascended my father. I have not yet seen my father. So that in itself refutes the idea that uh, Jesus was in paradise. Okay was had gone to paradise okay so there are there are different things here that we can look at different different bible verses that show one way or another we're not to take something just one little bible verse so extremely literally and to say yep it's based right there Sometimes, yes, translations, uh, King James Version. A lot of times people say, well, you can only use King James Version Bible strictly. Well, even then, uh, the King James Version Bible isn't a perfect uh, translation. It is, it is good in a lot of ways. Okay. Okay, if you believe in me, you have life. And Jesus promises that eternal life in John chapter 14, 1 through 3. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto me. So Jesus is giving that promise to everyone. He didn't give us a different promise to the thief. It wasn't a different promise. It, it, the thieves don't get a different promise. Uh, Jesus gave that promise, John chapter 14, 1 through 3. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I'll receive you unto me so that you can be where I am. I, where I am, you will be also. Jesus, so that is saying all those that believe in him, all those that have faith in him will one day be taken to live with Jesus all at the same time. Okay, let's, uh, Philippians 1, 21 through 24, Philippians, this is, this is a pretty good one, Philippians chapter 1, 21 through 24, okay, for to me, 
to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Okay, so uh, when did Paul expect to be with Christ and with the Lord? So here, okay, I, I didn't know a lot of people use this Bible verse for spiritualism. What, what, is, what is Paul saying here? What is he truly trying to say in these Bible verses? For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die has more, has more blessings. Okay, so if we, okay, we take that. We're, 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 we're thinking that manner. But if I live on in the flesh, but if I continue to live daily, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Okay, he doesn't have a choice. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ. A desire to part. Okay, so do we to say that, well, he is saying in verse 21, well, to live is Christ and to die is gain, because he must say, if you die, then you get to go to be with Christ. And let me just add immediately. Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? That changes everything if we say, if people want to say, Paul here is implying, well, if I continue to live, I have to live by the fruits of my labor. But if I die, it is more blessful because I get to go be with Christ. And let's add it again immediately. He's at rest. What's and Okay. Second Timothy. Second Timothy four verse eight. Okay. Second Timothy four verse eight. Okay. Uh, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the, the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all those all who have loved his spirit, okay, that will be given to me that day, that day when Jesus returns, okay. So, Paul here is saying, to for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To die is gain because, okay, and we take it a little bit further. Let's not just end there, but if I live on in the flesh. Now, well, let's, let's, let's just put it this way. What's going on here? Where is Paul right now? Pardon? He's in prison. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. He is writing to the Philippians, the church that he had, pre had uh, preached to about 10 years ago. He had originally went to, to uh, Philippi approximately 10 years ago and had spent some time there. Now he's rewriting them and he's telling them, I mean, well, he's, he's in prison and I don't know the outcome. I don't know what's going to happen, but my life is in Christ. And if I continue to live, if I am going to live, then I, it's by the fruits of my labor that through Christ, I can continue through hardships and through strain and through persecution, I can continue to prophesy, to preach to you. And it is through the gain of preaching to you that I will be with Christ. It is, I will press on in my current life, dealing with hardships but yet it's through that labor that I am to glorify Christ. But if, us, if I am to die here in prison, it is a reward as well. Because the next thing I know, when God comes in that second coming, I will see Christ. And Paul has, he, you remember what he said? Uh, not looking back, but looking forward, striving forward to the upward calling of Christ. And, and he says, and he also says in the end of one of his uh, epistles, I do not know, but I feel like I have finished the race. He has an assurance that if he dies that day, he really feels 
when the next thing he sees is Christ coming. And he feels that is a reward. That's why he is saying, if I die, that is, that is truly a gain. Okay? There's no spiritualism here. If we just take the other b- verses in, uh, the other, in all the epistles that Paul writes, we can see that his life is hard-pressed with persecution and controversy from other people, and yet he feels like it is a true reward to continue to preach God's gospel, Christ's gospel. And continue. But if he dies, he believes the race has been won. I feel like I have finished. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we use, we use Paul's writings, his own writings, to refute what some people might believe. This is spiritualism. This is talking about if I die, I, I will see Christ immediately. I go to heaven. No, no. We need to study. We need to understand Paul here. We need to understand the circumstances here. Paul's in prison. He's looking at life or death. Don't know. Don't know what I have. But if I continue to live, it's going to be full of persecution. But I feel like that is God's, it is a reward from God. And if I die, that's truly another reward because I will see him on that day as he symbolizes, he symbolizes in other epistles. On that day, that's reward, and it will be a reward for you, too, because you will know I have died preaching Christ's gospel. So, okay, we don't have much time left. Okay, 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20. Now, if anybody has... I mean, we're, we're rushing through these. There's a lot here in these four days of this, of this uh, lesson. But if, slow me down if, if, if we haven't really taken a look at anything you feel is important. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their, of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, the meekness and the, the fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is, for it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ has also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, and for, who formerly were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Okay. Wow. We got a lot there. And this leads to the classic idea that what, that Jesus did what while he was, while his body was laying in the grave. This leads to believe that Jesus did what? Okay. 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 So that hell meaning the spirits in prison. Okay. Uh, but this is leading to the fact that Jesus strictly went and talked to the antediluvian people, the people before uh, the uh, uh, before the great flood. Okay, so there's a lot there. There's a lot in there. Now, this this I studied this one for a long time, longest time this morning, I might say. So there's a lot here to try to understand. What's your basis for uh, truly believing that Christ did not descend into hell to talk to the people during Noah's time? What is your basis for saying this is, that's not right? Okay, okay. Well, we only got a few minutes left here. Let me, let's just dive into this fairly quick. Let's just try, try to come to the rational sanity and and understanding. Let's come to the biblical terms. Let's just put it that way. Let's come to the biblical 
terms here. First of all, we, we, we look at this. Here's some things were taken out of context during the uh, um, King James Version when, when it was translated out of Greek. Okay, so one problem here. Verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, a lot of times, if you look through uh, uh, Bible passages, it is always parallel in the Spirit, I mean, in the flesh, and in the Spirit. Now, there's many texts. Uh, you can take uh, 1 Peter 4, 6. If you turn to 1 Peter 4, 6, it says, For the reason the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now there's parallelism. It's in the flesh and in the spirit. If we turn to uh, what's another one, first Timothy three sixteen. First Timothy three sixteen. And we read this real quick. Uh, and without controversy controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Okay, you see the parallelism here. In the flesh, in the spirit. Now, this is ta- now a lot of Bible scholars believe that this by the spirit is not correct form. It should be in the spirit. Now, that that ta- that changes things a little bit. Now, if we read that and say, "For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive." In the spirit, okay, put to death in the flesh, literally in flesh form, in human form, he was put to death, but he was raised not only in human form, but in incarnate, he was of the spirit, okay, godliness, okay, so we're going a little bit further here. Now, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Prison isn't necessarily... Hades. This is talking about a uh, Bible verse. I'm trying to think where it was, uh, but it talks about he came to pro- to preach to the captives of this earth. Okay, captives means inmates in something, not necessarily in prison, but here in this sinful earth. This prison that is being talked about is the sinners that are captive in this on the earth during the time of Noah's time. Okay, so all the captives that were in sin. Okay, so we continue to go on. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Okay, but if we go back to night, and by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, verse 19, by whom seems to give reference and correlates to by the spirit. If we, but if we take verse 19 and we say that that is in response to the whole verse of 18, if we take 19 and we say that is in response to the whole verse of 18 and not strictly to the spirit, it changes everything. It changes the whole theology. So if we look at verse 19, by whom he Also, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That is meaning before that, uh, before that, that Jesus not only was, had preached through Noah, but the Holy Spirit had preached the salvation through Noah. Okay, so there's multiple things here and, and we're out of time. So. We're not quite getting through this, but again, we need to look at this and we need to look at other Bible verses and see how, what the language is to understand a Bible verse. We need to look at different things. And if we even turn to Revelation 6, we're going to go through this really quick. Revelations chapter 6, 9 through 11. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the, under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of, the, of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as were 
who would be killed as they were was completed. Okay. Again, we look at this and we see, okay, the people underneath the altar. Okay, so why is it that uh, God first dis- said we were not to eat meat because of the blood? What is the blood in reference to? What is blood? Life. Okay, blood is in reference to life. So if we read this, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of the God and for the testimony. This is the altar of the burnt offering where the blood was sprinkled. So if we take in, and, we, and we conclude that these martyrs, their life it was sprinkled around the altar as the same blood. So it is in re- it's in response to that their lives were given as a sacrifice for their belief in Christ. It's not talking literally about souls there. It's talking about their life was sacrificed. They, and they and the life, the blood is in, is in ref- reference to life. So their lives were giving as a sacrifice. And it's not literally saying that they are under the altar. It's just talking about the blood. So we can go, we didn't get far into this. I'm, I'm sorry, but we didn't get very far, and there's still probably a lot of, what are we talking about here? But we have to t- take other Bible verses, and we have to consider, what is other Bible verses telling us before we come to a conclusion on this one? Jen, real quick. Okay. And that's, that's what the lesson study brought out, because truly, so the lesson study, if you read your lesson, it talks about, and it had a quote out of the Bible commentary. Bible commentaries are great in trying to understand Bible passages, and it says, truly, if this is heaven, looking into heaven, you wouldn't have this or this or this or this. So that refutes the whole idea that this is truly talking about what is happening in heaven. Okay, so let's go ahead, and I know you're all saying, wait a minute, still a lot of questions here, but time has come to an end. Let's, let's, uh, Doreen, search the scriptures daily. Always be ready in season when someone, as, as in the very first, as it says, always be ready and give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope. Search the scriptures, be ready in season and out of season for when you are approached and asked, why do you believe this? Because it says this. To me, you know, some people say, well, it says this to me. Okay, let's end with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we can open up your word. And there is so much there. And we ask for your knowledge and wisdom so that we can understand, so that we will be ready. Not only when you come, but yet when other individuals might come to us and ask, what do you believe? We ask that you give us guidance and give us your wisdom. And that during that time, though, we ask that we, t- we open up the Bible and truly study to know what is there, not only for our benefit, but for others as well. We thank you in your name. Amen.